Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. You're a crazy lot. (laughs) I should fit in real good. Boy, I, I've never heard anything like this in my life. It's wonderful. They say that AA is not taught, it's caught. And, and, and anybody that comes here on a weekend like this that doesn't go away with all the batteries charged, well, they're in the wrong place, aren't they? As this young lady said, uh, my name's Bill and I'm from St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, uh, by way of England. Uh, I mean, as soon as you, as soon as I, well, we're allies, aren't we? <laughs> Our ships are out there now with yours, well, you know. <laughs> and uh, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink or any mood-changing ladies <laughs> since September the 19th, 1967. <laughs> I've thoroughly enjoyed the program so far. Uh, Bud and Huey and Bonnie are just lovely. I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me here. Uh, it's always nice to uh, attend one of these functions. I'll be honest with you, I'd rather be playing tennis with my son this weekend, but that's, you know, uh, as he said to me, it's uh, who much is given, much is asked, and I, I couldn't really argue too much with that. But as I say, I, uh, I'm a limey, and all I can say about that is that we invented the language, we can't help what the hell you've done with it. <laughs> Uh, I was born in a little mining town in Welbeck in the Midlands of England in Nottingham and uh, I was born illegitimately. I had no say in this. <laughs> Caused me a great deal of problems later on in my life but nevertheless that's the way it was. And I, I lived with my grandmother and grandfather and 13 other kids. You know, Bud was talking about outhouses last night. What's an outhouse, Bud? (laughs) Really? We used to just kick it around till we lost it. (laughs) You know, I'm not kidding. We were so poor when I was a kid that my grandfather used to suck a peppermint and we all sit, used to sit round his mouth to keep warm. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, you know, there was, there was a lot of stigma uh, uh, attached to being born illegitimate. Uh, I'm almost 66 next birthday. And uh, thank you, love. <laughs> and 65 years ago, like I say, there was a lot of stigma in this little mining town. It was a bit like Peyton Place. In fact, in England, uh, around this time, 1925, if a woman had two illegitimate children, and this is a fact, and we deal with facts, don't we? Uh, they could put her away for life. They could put her away for life. If they did that today, you'd wonder where the hell everybody went, wouldn't you? But. <laughs> But anyway, when I was uh, a little boy growing up, I didn't know any difference. And I lived in the Midlands, and I talked with this North Country dialect. If you've never heard them, that's how they speak, up in north, uh, north of England, you know. And I can remember as a little boy about four, going out at night, 
and stealing cabbages and turnips and chickens' eggs because the mines were closed down and my grandfather and grandmother had a big family to feed. Remember that. But anyway, when I was about five, five and a half, uh, suddenly there arrived down in Welbeck this car, and there weren't many cars in those days in Welbeck, and this lady that was my mother, very lovely lady, came, she wanted her Billy. And she had married a man that was a good deal older than herself. He was a very fine man, a very honest man, and a good man. And it was a very good arrangement that they had between them. My mother looked after him wonderfully well, and he looked after her. So I got to London, and just before I'd left Welbeck, my grandfather had given me a haircut, and in those days they put a basin on your head and they sheared up the side, you know. I looked like a coconut. I had a... <laughs> the style's right back in over there now. They call them skinheads, you know. <laughs> the cycle. And of course, when I got to London with this North Country accent and living in the East End of London, these little cockney kids used to come up to me and they used to say, Oh, mate, let's see you say something. Go on. And I used to stand there with this little coconut and I used to say, what do you want me to say? And they'd say, go on, say that again, what you just said, and they'd all be laughing, and you know what I discovered? I was sensitive. <laughs> I mean, alcohol, hey, you white, you are unalcoholic sensitive. Isn't it sickening? <laughs> If you don't believe this, if you don't believe this, just tell the girl next to you or the guy next to you that you don't like his shirt or her blouse and they'll never speak to you again. <laughs> oh, we're sensitive. <laughs> Try and get you kicked out of the group and everything. Anyway, my stepfather had a very good position. He was manager of a big department, general manager of a big departmental store in London. And after I'd been run, running around the streets of London in the marketplaces and everywhere and developed a real Cockney accent uh, environment, and we're all sober today by the grace of God and the environment, the atmosphere, it's caught, eh? Uh, they decided... <laughs> that they were going to send me to a private school where I could uh, be something. Maybe a lawyer or a doctor or something. So they sent me to Harlow College in Essex, which was a boarding college. And when I got there, I was a fish out of water. Because when I got there, you know, I had now developed this Cockney accent. And these kids used to come up to, to me and they used to say, I say, old chap, let's hear you say something. <laughs> I, I mean, you must have heard those people that come over here and they tell you how marvelous it was over there and you wonder what the hell they're doing here. Right? <laughs> and they gave me elocution lessons. They used to write things on the board for me and they'd say, stand up, Cole. And I was sensitive, you know. And I'd read this on the board because I, I could read. And I'd say, Harry hit him on the head with a hard heavy hammer and it hurt him. And all the class had laughed. And I'd look around and the one that was laughing the most was going to get it when we got outside. Because I'm not only sensitive now, but I'm building up some anger. <laughs> Uh, I was at that school from the time I was about seven and a half or eight till I was about ten. And then one day the matron came to me and she said, you have a visitor. 
And that was great, because you always got out of school for a little while. I'm, sh I'm sharing with you now. I'm, I'm opening up my heart to you. See? And I went out there, and there was a nice car out there, and this gentleman was out there, and we went out to a little place called Bishop Stalford, a few miles from the college. And this chap told me he was my Uncle Bill. And I liked him very much. I, I really did. He was a fun guy. And when we got back, he gave me a few shillings, and that was great. Any kid likes money. And he said, I'll come and see you again, Billy. And I said, oh, all right, Uncle Bill. And I don't know whether it was two or three months afterwards, he came again, and off we went for the day down to Epping. I remember this very well. It was to haunt me for years. And on the way back, he said, Billy, he said, I'm your father. I said, you, you're my father? He said, yes, Billy. I said, well, you know, I thought my, my grandmother and my grandpa, he said, yes, Billy, he said, they are your grandmother and grandfather. See, I, I thought when they sent me to London, they didn't want me. And then when I got to London and my parents sent me to Harlow, I thought they didn't want me. And he said, yes, I'm your father, Billy. He said, but... I said, well, what about Pop Cole? He said, well, that's your stepfather, Billy, but your mother's your mother. He said, but I'm your father. And I didn't quite understand all this, but I, I, I accepted it. I took to it like a duck to water because I liked him. And he said, I'll come and see you again, Billy. He said, uh, and I said, okay, Dad. And you see, the sad part about it was he never came back again. And I sat by the little church at Harlow there, waiting for him on weekends, watching the cars come in there, looking for him. And I thought, well, he doesn't want me either. So we know about inferiority complex. We know about low esteem. We know about these things. And I started to tell lies because my pal started asking me, when's your dad coming back again? And I started making excuses. Well, he's got hurt in a car crash. Uh, he got hurt flying his plane. And this sort of thing. And the lies started. And I, I don't think up until that time I, I had told lies. But I started to lie. And one thing led to the other. And I finished up running away from that school when I was about 12. And they told me I was the first guy that ran away from that school in 200 years. <laughs> but it's a good job that I did left or I'd have taken all the bricks from the place, I'll tell you. And of course I got back to Essex and my parents sent me to day college, but the die was cast. I started to get in trouble. And I got in more trouble. And I got in more trouble. And you see, I couldn't communicate with my father. And the very basis of this wonderful fellowship that we have is communication. One drunk talking to another one. I couldn't communicate with my father. Couldn't do it. He was a, he was an old guy. In fact, he was born old. He was a good man, you know. And like most very good men, he was kind of boring. He loved his stamp collection and things like that. And, you know, and that's okay. So I was sent to a reformatory when I was about 13 and uh, something. And I was there 15 months. And the last six months, and then this is a reformatory, uh, they thought that if you, they beat you good and made you work hard, uh, this would have an effect on you, and it did. I became a good fighter. And with a lot of hostility. Wasn't a bad kid, just mixed up. The last six months I was there, they had a little machine shop, and I worked in there, and when I came out, about 14 and a half, I got a job as an apprentice toolmaker in Dagnum in Essex. 
And I worked there for 18 months. The war had started in 39 in England. And in 1941 of September, uh, I joined the Royal Navy as an engine room artist of a fifth class, as a tradesman. That's like going in the army as a corporal. So I wasn't stupid. I was just screwed up. Nobody had sat down with me and explained what the rules are. And that is the problem, I believe, with most of us. Nobody had ever sat down. It's like me leaving St. Catharines to drive down here without a map. I'm going to finish up in Anchorage or something. I mean, that's the, I, I, I always did this. I never had any direction. The first time in my life I ever had any direction when, when I came to this fellowship and a bunch of guys that understood me started explaining things. That's the first time. If I get a map and I say, well, I gotta go to here and I gotta go to there and I gotta go here. If I get off the road sometimes and I get lost, I can pull in at a service station and they'll put me on the right road. In AA, we do it with our sponsors. We go and tell them. Pick a good sponsor and he puts you back on the right track. He says, well, what you need is a meeting. Come on, let's go. In 1947, I was welterweight champion of the British Navy and I'm proud of that. At the same time I was welterweight, there was a young man, a fine young man, I knew him very well, called Randolph Turpin, that went on to become the middleweight champion of the world. He beat Sugar Ray Robinson, which is no mean feat. And Randy and I became pretty good friends. In fact, I courted his sister, Lily, for a while. That's a lovely word, courting, isn't it? I tell you, we were caught in one or two places, but anyway... <laughs> Mind you, at this time, her older brother was middleweight champion of the British Empire, so I didn't take too many liberties, you know. <laughs> uh, I came out of the Navy and I started to box as a professional. Ted Kid Lewis, the former welterweight champion of the world, was my manager. And he told me I was going to go places, and I believed him because I had enough hostility in me and enough hatred in me and I had to prove something, see? Because I was illegitimate. I had to prove that I was as good or better, and this nearly destroyed me too. This nearly destroyed me too. I could never achieve enough. I could never achieve enough. I was traveling around the different cities and towns and there used to be a bunch of guys used to come to the fights, three or four of them, and they were beautifully dressed, Savile Row suits, Stetsons, teddy bear coats, rubber shoes. They're all crooks. I mean, crooks don't wear army boots, you know. <laughs> yeah, they were thieves. I, I never knew this at the time, what they call wide boys. And one of the fellows said to me, he said, listen, Bill, where are you fighting next? I said, I'm fighting in Manchester at Bellevue. He said, well, geez, we'll pick you up and take you up there. I said, well, that's great. So we went up to Manchester, and I pulled up there, and we're coming back, and we're all happy, and we're laughing, and uh, I, I said, this is a beautiful car. I think it was a Jaguar. I said, uh, are you in the, the, the car business? He said, well, you might say that, Bill. He said, we've, we've stolen this one. <laughs> and you know something? I didn't see anything wrong in that at all. I mean... The abnormal becomes normal. You live long enough abnormally, it's a normal way of life. People that had nice houses and washed the cars and went to church, they were real squares. Remember? <laughs> Remember that? These idiots that went to work every day and made a living and brought the kids up and clothed them, jeez. I don't want to be like them. So I cast my lot in with these fellows, and one night they had a good idea. <laughs> well, it sounded like a good idea at the time. They were going to rob this warehouse in Wapping in London. And I went with them, and I was to get in trouble, I was to get caught, and I was to go to prison. 
And I'm not proud of that, but I haven't come all the way down here to tell you something that isn't so. I went to prison. I'm fortunate today because uh, I get round to quite a few prisons within the program. And the message I have for them is a little bit different than the one I'm giving you today with my heart. Because I get there and they have baseball diamonds and TV sets, and that's all right. You can have either steak or stew, or, and I, I, I look at this, it amazes me. And one guy's swapping his playboy for a penthouse, and I look at this. You know, son, I was locked up for 23 and a half hours a day for about 18 months. And if it rained, I didn't get any exercise. And I got one book a week. And I had no say in this. The trusty, the red band, would come out when you're on exercise and put a book on your, on your, on your shelf in your cell, in your Peter. And I had the strangest books. I got most of my learning from these books. I had a book one time called The Life of a Tetsy Fly. You know? Yeah, the li that life of a tetsy fly. <laughs> and being a good alky in the making, I look down the index and it says the sex life and that's the first page I turn to. <laughs> and some filthy swine had torn this page out. <laughs> well, whatever turns you on. I remember the Christmas before I came out there, the governor's inspection, and the governor Harvey came round. Stand by your door, you know, hear the screws, doors going, bang, 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 and, and then the governor's there, and I have to step back, and he said, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And, you know, I looked at him, and he said, what are you doing in here? And I said, 18 months old, you know. He said, no, he said, what's a fellow like you doing in here? He said, I've been watching you, you know. He said, you made a good stuff. You've got a good naval record. You, Why are you in here? And I said, I don't know, sir. I'm paying my debt to society. He said, you know something, Cole? He said, God loves you. Merry Christmas. And the door slammed and I sat down, this tough, hardened con that would fight over a cigarette butt or a piece of bread. I sat down at that table and I cried my eyes out. God loves me. And I decided at that time that I would never go back. I said, they're never going to get me back in one of these places again. And they never have. Oh, I've been drunk a couple of times and thrown in the slammer, but that was a weekend rest. <laughs> <laughs> so I came out and I figured I've got to get away from these people. I, I, I knew too many villains. So I decided I was going to emigrate to Canada. I got a Queen's pardon. I got a Queen's pardon from my prison sentence. I did something afterwards. I apprehended a thief on the street and I got a pardon. My record was wiped out. Pretty vicious thief he was too. He was hitting guys over the head with a pick shaft and robbing them of the wages. And I came to Canada and I love Canada. I love Canada and I love America. I love America so much that I just bought a home in Florida. I'm going to be a snowbird. <laughs> I have two daughters down there in Dunedin and Clearwater and I'm looking forward to spending time with them. So I came to Canada with all the aspirations, young man, 26 years old. And you know the funny part about this was, I hadn't drunk until this time. I can't blame alcohol for the problems I got in. I was screwed up. 
I needed somebody to give me a map. I needed somebody to sit down with me and explain what the rules were, because I didn't know. And I worked for a Swedish steel company for 10 years, Sandvik, as a senior engineer of this company. And I left that company to go as manager of an American company from Midland, Pennsylvania, a company called Crucible Steel. So you see, I wasn't stupid, just screwed up. And it was when I got to Sandvik and got into selling that I started to drink, and I liked it right from the word go. It made me feel better, made me feel more comfortable with people. Uh, I, I didn't know that uh, I was an alcoholic. I should have known, I suppose. You know, I went out of town and got drunk a few times, but lots of times we had social activities. I got married, by the way. Uh, you know, I don't mean social activities. Uh, but I started with Crucible. And I was down in Midland, Pennsylvania, and I'll share this with you Americans, because uh, I had finished work one, one evening from the mill and they dropped me off at this Statler Hilton Hotel, I think it was. And now I'm drinking pretty heavy. So I went in the bar, which is a natural place for a guy to go when he's finished work and he has a drinking problem. And I sat down there and there was a fella sitting a couple of seats away from me from the bar, an American. And you know, you Americans are very friendly. You're really very outgoing. You are, you know. You're, you're so friendly. And I sat there and put on the usual act. I don't know if any of you ever told lies when you were drinking, eh? <laughs> but the bartender said to me, he said, what would you like? And I said, I'd like a dry martini, old boy, and don't bruise it, whatever the hell that meant, you know. But <laughs> And I'm drinking there, and there's an American sitting a couple of ways, seats away from me, and he said, uh, hi. You're from England, aren't you? And I said, yes. He said, well, my name's so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. I'm a lawyer in town. And I said, I'm very pleased to meet you. I said, I'm Dr. Cole. <laughs> See, I figured if he's a lawyer, I'll be a doctor tonight. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was a bit like Rich Little. You never knew who you were talking to. <laughs> I'm Dr. Cole. So we had a drink there, and we got pretty friendly. He was telling me about the planes he was flying over Germany and all this stuff. And, and he said, look, doctor, he said, are you doing anything this evening? And I looked at him, because you, you never know, do you? You know, and I, I, I said to him, I said, what have you got in mind? And he said, there's a few friends having dinner tonight, and we'd like you to join us. I said, I'd love to. So I went up to my room and I had a shower and put a dark suit on, striped tie, white shirt, learned this at Harlow, see? Dr. Cole tonight. And I came down and they were all there, lovely. Have you ever noticed that about wealthy people? They always look so nice, don't they? All in the ladies in the evening dress and the men look good. And I thought, boy, I fit in here real well. And they sat me at this dinner table. There were about 80, 90 people there. And we had a table for eight, and they sat me next to an elderly lady. Now, age is relative, isn't it? I'm 65, and somebody that's old is 95. You know, when I went in the Navy at 16, and I saw these guys 35, I wondered what they were doing with all these old fellas in the Navy. So age is relative. Age is somebody that's about 30 years older than you are. Except for my pop, he was born old. <laughs> so they sat me next to this elderly lady and we're drinking there and the guest speaker that night, by the way, these were the foremost lawyers in Allegheny County, but as Alk is, we're pretty cunning and baffling too. And uh, uh, So I was, I was there and yes, and no, and you know, Harlow, jolly good show, and well done, and bravo, and you know, and it's very easy to talk like that. You just put a hot potato in your mouth and you've got it, you know. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and the guest speaker that night was Robert F. Kennedy. He was Attorney General and he was talking about the bail system as it applied in Alle Allegheny County. And a lot of things I don't remember when I was drinking and it's just as well, but I remember this. 
because we both, this elderly lady, all of us around the table got a copy of his speech on this bail system. So they were standing up and giving him a standing ovation and I got up and got my cop, this lady's copy, uh, this elderly lady's copy, and my copy, I was about 35 and I think she was probably 65. And I got her copy and I walked past, we were sat just about there, and I walked past the table at police, both ends. And I said, excuse me, and they got out of the way. And Robert F. Kennedy was shaking hands with somebody across the, and I came up and slapped him on the back. Hey, Bob, you got a minute? <laughs> and he was a little bit hurt, you know. He turned around and he said, who are you? Could fight him with the mafia at this time, I think. I said, I'm Dr. Cole. And he looked at me and he probably saw I'd had a, you know. And he said, what can I do for you? I said, would you be so kind, uh... Mr. Kennedy has to sign this copy of your speech as a memento of this auspicious occasion. And I gave him the pen and, I, and then I'm telling him what to write. You know, best wishes Dr. Robert F. Kennedy. I said, would you sign my wife's please? Best wishes Robert F. Kennedy. I said, thank you very much. And then I said something, he said something to me and I said something to him about Americans being very friendly and I had a little bit of a laugh and I sat down. Now the lawyer that had invited me, he's standing there and he's going. <laughs> and he said, Doctor, I had no idea you do Mr. Kennedy. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't want to go up to, into that now. Are we going up to the panorama room? Because it said something about the panorama room. I said, I, I don't want to go into that now. Are we going up to... And this little old lady, she's holding my arm, this copy of this speech, you know, she's so happy, jeez. <laughs> and we get up there, and I'm at home there because they've got a little string quartet, and they're pl having fox struts and quick steps, and, and uh, tangos, and I'm swinging her around and throwing her around. And, <laughs> and then I said, would you like to come down to my room and see my etchings? <laughs> and she said, yes. <laughs> I can't remember too much of what happened down there. I remember struggling with something. But <laughs> anyway, anyway, she shot out the door and down the hall, and I, I put about 20 years on her life with all this adrenaline that was pumping. You know, she shot down the, like, that hallway like Ben Johnson with the steroids, you know, zoom. <laughs> and I didn't think anything about that. I had a couple of bells and went to bed and slept, you know, next day back at the mill. Came back that night, there was a uh, message. I went up, any message, never any messages for me, you know, but got to put on the, any, are there any messages for me? Uh, yes, Dr. Thank you. And I looked at it, he said, the limousine will pick you up at six o'clock, doctor. And I thought, what limousine? <laughs> but I, I went up to my room and I had a quick shower and cleaned up. I had a couple of belts to get the mood. <laughs> hey. <laughs> you ever do that when you go to pub? Have a couple of belts to get the mood. <laughs> By the time everybody else is in the mood, you're passed out or... <laughs> Or getting yourself a lot of trouble with a housewife or something. But anyway, this limousine picked me up and off we go across Pittsburgh. And I'm getting a bit scared. Mind you, I had a couple of bells, so. And I said to the chauffeur, I said, hey, where are we going? He said, something, something, something. I said, okay. And we pulled up and opened the door for me and I got out and there at the door, they said, there's this elderly lady. Lovely building. Lovely building. There's this old, old doctor. It was so good of you to come to speak for us at such short notice. <laughs> About once every three months they have a meeting and a dinner at the alumni of Vasa University and I was the guest speaker that night. <laughs> so I sat down at the table. I mean, I'm, I'm in up, up to here now. Might as well go over, you know. I sat down at the table and I had a couple of belts 
and I was feeling pretty good, but my mind's racing. Oh boy, our minds race when we get in trouble, don't they? Oh boy, do our minds ever race. And I thought, I know what I'll do, I'll baffle them with bullshit. <laughs> Why are you? <laughs> so anyway, I got up there on the podium and they gave me a little pointer and some chalk. And I decided to talk, tell them about this heart valve I was working on. See, I had enough, I had enough engineering knowledge, you know, I, and I was telling them about this heart valve. This was before pacemakers. You know, I, I was way ahead of my time. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, you know, I, I drew a circle first. Always start off with a circle. You know, like the cowboys, form a circle. And I drew a couple of wires from it. And I said, the strength of the current that flows between the two points of the current is directly proportional to the potential difference and inversely so. <laughs> Pretty good start. <laughs> and it's made of a nickel chrome molybdenum, about 62 rock well, and I was throwing all this, you know, spoke for 20 minutes and they gave me a standing ovation. <laughs> Now, any good practicing alcoholic is going to get in trouble at home. If he doesn't get in trouble at home, then he's not a good practicing alcoholic. <laughs> and I got in trouble and I decided, we decided, we'd take the geographical cure and, we, uh, <laughs> and I went to New Zealand, <laughs> like 13,000 miles away. And that was fine, except they've got taverns over there. And we were separating and unseparating and separating and unseparating. My poor wife, I say my poor wife, I was terrified of this woman. <laughs> well to wait chump. I was, she should, she should have been, she, she missed a vocation, honest to God. She should have been, been teaching guerrilla warfare <laughs> to the Gurkhas, you know. Gee, she was tough. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God. I used to have, I have to have a stop on the way home and have two or three bells to give me the nerve to go the rest of the way. <laughs> Why, well, she had me marked, I'll tell you. And you know the sad part about this, we'd separate and she'd invite me up. Because we'd get lonely after about a month. And I'd go up there and she'd get half a dozen beers or a small bottle of whiskey. And we'd start off fine. And my daughters, God bless them, they'd be there hoping everything was going to be all right this time between dad and mum, because my daughters love me, and I love, I love kids. I love kids. They're so innocent. You know, I learned, I, I, after I, for, for a good number of years, I worked with unprivileged kids, hard, tough kids. And you know, you tell a kid he's winning, he's lovely, he's good, he's great. Please remember this. And he'll be good, and he'll be lovely, and he'll be great. You tell him he's winning, he'll do anything. But we're apt to tell him he's stupid. Why'd you do that, stupid? I don't know that. Yeah, it's stupid. Get in there before I knock your bloody head off. You're stupid. You're stupid. And, and the kid's about nine years old, and you've tell it, tell, told him 10,000 times that he's stupid, and you wonder why he's acting the way he is. You know, phone rings, you say, if that's not, if that's for me, don't uh, tell them I'm not here. And then you start wondering why the kid's telling you lies. You know, I've told that kid a million times to stop exaggerating. I don't know where he gets it from. <laughs> There's so much clay. Believe me, I know. You tell those kids they're lovely, they're great. Do it, do it. We, I see the little kids running around, they're so innocent, so lovely. And they wanted mum and dad to get back together, but we'd have two or three drinks and then we'd get fighting. You know. And uh, one time I went right through a plate glass going through the door because she was chasing me with a carving knife. <laughs> Thank God I could run. <laughs> 
and that ended in divorce. She divorced me. Unfortunately, my love, she was a practicing alcoholic too and we didn't know and she's still drinking today. And it's sad. And she won't have anything to do with the children. I came back to Canada before I got thrown in jail in New Zealand and I started over again and I'd write to my children and I'd send them presents and they'd come back, not at this address. I got a letter from my 15-year-old second daughter Betty, one time, saying, Dad, I don't know what's wrong, but I love you. And I've still got that letter today. I try, I love it. That, that gave me hope. That gave me hope. I used to drive along and look at kids and think, gee, they're like my daughters. I didn't see my children for six years. Then, then I got word from England that my mother was dying. So I went over there and I was talking to Mum. And she told me, one of the last things she ever said to me, she said, Billy, she said, there's only two men I've ever loved in my life. That's you and your father, your real father. She left me with that. She also left the children a little money and they came back to Canada. Thank God for that. The family came back to Canada and I was to get reunited with my girls. I had got married again to a lovely woman. She was a school teacher. In fact, she, she taught emotionally disturbed children and that was a big plus for me, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and she told me about AA and she went to meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting with me. And it's a tremendous, tremendous strength she gave me. She gave me back my manhood. I'd say, well, because I, I wasn't used to making decisions. You wives know Alan on wives, the wives had made all the decisions. I wasn't used to making them anymore, but she made me learn again how to make decisions. At this time, I had, I had come back and got established with a company, another Swedish steel company called Seco. Fergusta Seco is the sales manager of that company. The president of that company is in the program about 12 years as a result of me going out to apologize to him years before, after I got in the program and making my amends to them. But he said, Bill, he said, uh, we're having a do at the Skyline big hotel on the weekend. He said, uh, we'd like you and your wife to come. And my wife went out and got her hair done. And this is a big deal because Cr Crown Prince Bertel was coming from Sweden. And I got a chance to meet royalty. And I went over there Saturday morning and take all the booze and he'd given me a couple of bottles of aquavar to take with me uh, because that's a Swedish drink, very strong. And I got over there, got everything ready, the glasses, cigarettes, cartons of cigarette booze, everything was fine. And then I thought, well, that's done, I'll have a drink. I had a drink, it wasn't in the program yet. I had a drink. And boy, you know, I mean, when I poured a drink, I mean, I poured a drink. I didn't mess around, you know. And uh, I, I'd drink and uh, the goose, goose pimples had come up and that was about right. <laughs> and then I thought, well, I'll have another one and then I'll head home. And then I had another one and then I met a guy in the elevator. I knew we went in the bar and I didn't go home. But I remembered something that we had to be there at seven o'clock. And I go and I see this procession going through and I get on the end of it, hadn't cleaned up, half smashed, following them down there, <laughs> you know. And I get down the bottom of this big table there and there's the president of SKF, there's the president of Sandvik, the president of SECO, the Swedish ambassador, the governor general, all beautifully dressed with these red sashes and the little medals. I don't know what they got the medals for, they were neutral in the last war, but they got them, they got them up there. And I get up on the podium and shake hands with Crown Prince Patel. And I, told, I, I said to him, I said, you're a drone. You're a non-productive bee. Us workers, and I sounded like some big communist leader, but I was smashed. And I wouldn't let go of his hand. And he's pulling it and I won't let go of it. And I'm only wiry, but I'm strong. I'm holding him. And the Governor General and the Ambassador came up. They knew something was wrong. And they tried to pull me away. 
Worst thing you can do to an alcoholic that's nuts. So I hit the Swedish ambassador <laughs> and I gave the Governor General a shot and then I took my coat off and I said, all right, you Vikings, come on up here. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I thought, would you believe I had trouble with step two? <laughs> but that was, that was the turning point because nobody would hire me. Nobody wanted anything to do with me. So I'm, I'm, I've lost everything. I'm, I'm, I'm on skid row and I'm working as a bouncer at the Blue Orchid. Yeah. And I'm standing there like that, you know, watching all these grunts, grinning. And this guy, Silverstein, that owned the place, used to come up. He says, you're so happy, Bill, you're always grinning. And I said, yeah, that's because I'm the only one that knows when the fight's going to start. I mean, you know, Madison Mark Chair. It was shortly after that, as I say, I was, Rose told me about Alcoholics Anonymous. One night I came home drunk, juice, uh, cheap wine I was drinking at this time to get the distance. And I came in this night and I sat down and I got knelt down. I'd come to the end. I'd gone in this bathroom that was all, this mirror was all cracked, that this house I shared with about 17 other guys, rooms in there, a buck a night. And I looked at my eyes in this cracked mirror and I saw the insanity, the men in the glass. And I went back in my room, I was frightened. See, I thought I was different. Hey, do you, do you think, well, I'm different? Do you remember that old song, the ankle bone's connected to the shin bone, the shin bone's connected to the knee bone, the knee bone's connected to the thigh bone? Did you ever see anybody whose ankles were connected to his ass? You know, <laughs> but I'm different. I'm different. Oh, I'm different, all right. M mad. But I knelt down there and I said my prayers. I said, please, God, help me. You say, suffer little children to come unto you. Help me, God, please. And I sat there waiting for the daylight to came and bang, bang at the door. And it was Rosie that taught the emotionally disturbed kids. And she told me about Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, I think I have a problem. She said, phone them. I said, you phone them, love. Well to wait, champ. You phone them. You know, chicken. She said, no, it's better if you phone them. And I phoned them and a the guy came over there at eight o'clock and I was hiding behind the curtain. But Rose was there. She said, somebody, Bill here? She said, yeah, he's there behind the curtain. <laughs> Always got a quick answer. Yeah, I've lost me coupling somewhere, you know. And, and I went to the meeting with this guy and things started to change as they had to. Things started to change and we went to a lot of meetings together. Power of strength, this lady. Power of strength. Had two children. Michelle two, Stephen four. Beautiful children. They helped fill a void for me because my own three were still in New Zealand. And I love him. My boy works with me today. He's the sales manager of my company. My, my youngest daughter is at McMaster's University. She gets a PhD this year in psychiatry. That's what this program's done. It's also got my three oldest daughters back. The rejected stone has become the cornerstone. Every time these kids have a problem, usually money, phone dead. <laughs> I had so much guilt, I nearly went bankrupt. You know, when he got to the Mercedes, that was time to call it quits. But I told him how to get it. Things started to change. And they're all round now. They're all round. They're round all the time. I'm glad to see the back of them sometimes. They come in noise, yelling, shout up. And I'm, bye, bye, see you next week. Oh, Jesus is crap. <laughs> And things change. You know, somebody told me about retreats. I said, I'm a Protestant. I mean, I haven't been to church in 25. I'm a Protestant. I'm an Anglican. They said, well, I don't think they'll mind, Bill. <laughs> and I went out of this retreat marvellous. Father Bill, Alki, 15 years sober. Got about four or five years in. 
And one particular retreat, I'll share this with you. Please, loves, listen to this, please, loves. Okay. I was going on the, this retreat, and I went in the little room, and I said my prayers, and I said, please, God, if it's your will for me, I want to take the fourth and fifth step. Because my sponsor, Raymond Douglas Stanford, he's dead now, a marvelous sponsor, he said that guys got drunk, and guys had filthy tempers, that they carried all their lives because they had never taken the fourth and fifth steps. That's what he told. And I believe it. I believe it. These rotten tempers are guilt. It says made a searching and fearless moral inventory. A searching, a, like when you were kids and you hide and seek. Everything comes out. And I, I said, God, please help me with this fourth step. And I went there and sitting in a little pew there and Father Bill came out and he said, good evening my dear men. He said, some of you will be looking at the fourth step while you're here. I'll tell you how I took it. And I sat up because I honestly believe and I believe to this, that this was a message from God. I'll tell you how I took it. We've heard it so many times. You can't give away something you haven't got. And he said, what I did, my dear man, was <clears throat> I made a film of my life. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, I mentioned this little old lady running down the hall. That was, that was, yeah, that was nothing. <laughs> oh my God. He said, but what I did was I started off and then I got to something that I didn't like and I cut that piece of film out and I put it in a box and I edited the film together and then I went along a bit further, cut that film out, put it in a little box. He said, until I had the film that I wanted to show my family and my loved ones. And I went back to my room and imagination snip, 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 you know, kept cutting things out I wouldn't want anybody to see, you know. But I put the film together about when I was a little boy and I used to go out and steal eggs at night to help feed my family. When I, went, when I joined the Navy, I volunteered, put my age up, and I went in there when I was welterweight champ. Little things I did take in my mum flowers, and little things, little things. And I had this big box of garbage. Everything that brought me to the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous were in this box. And I went to my sponsor, Ray. I said, Ray, I've got to talk to you. I mean, there was some, there was some unbelievable things in this, in this thing. And I thought, he's going to hate me. He's never going to speak to me again. But you know something? I wasn't so sensitive now. <laughs> you know, we, we start to, to get over this sensitivity. We find answers. You know, people come up and they say, uh, so and so, a guy comes up and he says, I see Germany beat England at their national sport, soccer, eh? And I said, yeah, but we beat them twice at their national game. He said, when was that? I said, 1918 and 1945. <laughs> <laughs> you see, it's better than telling them to get stuff, you know. And sometimes I tell them, go and get stuff. <laughs> yeah, because we quit running away. Don't. I beg of you, don't. Don't take that fourth and fifth step lightly. Oh, it's better, and maybe later on. But remember Father Bill, how he took it. And you know that was the answer to my prayers. I, I, I have good days. I've had bad days. Of course we have. Pain is a fact of life. We heard Bud talking about his daughter. and Pain is a fact of life. People get sick. People die. Your loved ones think that... If you don't recognize that pain's a fact of life, you're in a lot of trouble. Pain's a fact of life. But we learn in this fellowship how to deal with it one day at a time. God will not give you any more than you can handle one day at a time. Father Bill. Father Bill. We hear about guys getting slips. Oh, I had a slip. Did you? Yeah, I slept there. <laughs> what happened? I got bored with the meeting. I stopped going to meetings. 
Did you? Yeah, and so I don't slip. You didn't have a slip, you had a relapse. A slip's what you do in the snow, but you don't wait there till summer to get up. <laughs> you don't have a slip. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. we're tentative, aren't we? <laughs> you know, my business did very well because I'm not a dummy, I'm not the smartest guy in the world by any yardstick but I'm not a dummy either and I started to put things together and I got good people working with me and a few years ago I went over to England because I mum's word, I loved you and your dad and I got a, I, I knew the name was Furness of my father and I went over and I found a, uh, uh, some lawyers, family of lawyers named Furness in Manchester and I said look this is the situation, this is what it is. And for about six years they searched with me, phoning and writing to them, and then they said, we think we found your brother and sister. Half-brother and sister. And I went over there, and I phoned them, and I met this chap at Heathrow Airport, and I looked at him, he said, my God Almighty, he said, you're the image of dad, I don't need to see anything. And he put his arms around me and he hugged me. See, I was afraid of being rejected. We are afraid of being rejected. He put his arms around me and he hugged me. And it was proved that this was my half-brother and I love him. Oh, I, oh, I love him. And my half-sister and I love her. They're as crazy as I am. <laughs> I love them. I love them. I just love them. Just love them. I'm going to be with them next month for a little while. Looking forward to that. We get together and none of us are all talking at the same time and everybody's weird. Seems to, you know how we do that? Everybody's yakking, but you listen. For, we're going to carry on four or five conversations. Everybody, you know, the way I are, the way our family are. It's great. So things do happen. I found them. I found my roots. I found the thing that was bothering me. I'm not perfect, as I say, and stay away from the perfect people. You know, if you're perfect, leave your car here and fly home. But, but come down low enough so I can throw a brick at you. <laughs> yeah, perfect people. Perfect are perfect. Perfect pain in the ass. <laughs> so something, something else Father Bill taught me that we say after the perfect prayer the perfect prayer that we say after every meeting in most places throughout the world taken from the big big book the bible the big big book a lot of things in our big book that are taken from the big big book our father that art in heaven he's ours, he's everybody's what it says, our father whether you're black or white, or rich or poor, or Anglican, whether you're Catholic, whether you're Jew, doesn't matter, he's our father and surely we can be a little nicer to, to, to people around us and enjoy the difference. Enjoy the difference. If everybody looked like me, wouldn't this be a bloody dull world? You could get away with a lot, but it would be a dull world. <laughs> enjoy the different faces. These are God's flowers. Hallowed be his name. It means we love. We love our parents. We love our kids. We love. We hallow. We can fight with them, but you keep your nose out of it, Jack. <laughs> this is family business. We love him. We hallow his name. Give us this day our daily bread. We got it. We're sober. And we can handle anything today. We got our daily bread. We're sober. Part our love. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. As we forgive. I've got an awful lot to be forgiven for with my family and I get even with them today not like I used to I get even with them today by listening to them and, 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 and opening up my heart to them and giving them to them see and I hear people saying hey, hey 20 years sober I'll never forgive that son of a bitch you've seen them they look like they've bitten into a prune <laughs> I, you know they're so dry they're a fire hazard 
you know, we, we, yeah, I've been sober. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll never forgive that son of a bitch for what he did during the war. What war? I'll never forgive my mother, my brother, my father, my sister, my husband. Why? Who the hell are you? Who are you? No, I know, you're perfect. Well, you can, you can not worry about that if you're perfect, but I'm not. And I have to worry about that. I have to forgive. Because God is forgiving. Like this program, it's for giving away. Yeah. That's what it said. Then they're like butter wouldn't melt in the mouth. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. <laughs> boy. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And the, the glory's in this room. And the power's in this room because you can carry the message better than anybody on the face of this earth. You've been there. I know what it is to hurt. I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to be lonely. I know what remorse... I know... Tell me about it. And that's okay. As you said, adversity makes for character. Adversity makes for character. The rejected stone shall become the cornerstone. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. It doesn't say... It says forever. Add in for forever. Amen. So be this prayer. So be this prayer that I give to you, Dad. I may never see you a lot, any, any of you, anymore, but I take you back in my heart to St. Catherine's. And all I would ask of you is that you remember me, Bill as loving you very, very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.